What is the appropriate response to seditious words printed about our political leaders? Are these matters related to free speech or treasonous sedition? Our modern politics raise these questions, and we may look to early modern England for the answers. Let's find out today on Footnoting History. Welcome to another episode of Footnoting History. I am your host, Leslie Skousen, and today we will explore the role of censorship during a period of massive, turbulent change. It can be so tempting to restrict commentary during periods of rapid change, especially the type of commentary that can weaken the authority of those in power. This is why free speech can be so important. Today, we'll be talking about the English Reformation. The Reformation was so much more than just a religious transition or an argument about the nature of miracles. The issues at stake were about power, money, and decision-making. The movement reflects both a top-down and bottom-up challenge to the all-powerful Catholic Church. By that, I mean that the religious challenge and the transition of power came from both those in power and through popular grassroots uprising. But therein reflects the larger consequences. By having many interested parties, additional strife rose quickly within a place like England. What should govern the soul of the people, parliament and crown, or public opinion? As it became increasingly clear that England would pull away from the Catholic Church in order to create something new, a massive gathering of Parliament to implement these changes was clearly necessary. The seven-year meeting under Henry VIII became known as the Reformation Parliament. They met to address these issues from 1529 until 1536, negotiating the business of replacing all of the roles that the Church had played in daily life among the English people. You see, in addition to providing Sunday services, the Catholic Church had become the backbone of society. They ran hospitals, they cared for the sick, they fed and clothed the poor, and they welcomed all people who suffered and had nowhere else to go. By confiscating and eliminating the convents, monasteries, and chantries, the English government was making enormous, fundamental changes to social services that would not become clear until well into the reign of Queen Elizabeth decades later. Even minor issues, like serving the poor, would trigger the creation of poor laws that inspired modern-day welfare. These were really big issues, and they touched all parts of social life. The decisions implemented during the Reformation Parliament were colored somewhat by a series of Reformation-era pamphlets spread far and wide during parliamentary meetings. Hundreds of pamphlets attempted to sway both parliamentarians and public opinion. Some of them were published under well-known names. Others were anonymous. All of them sought to reach the hearts and minds of the people and their representatives. Even illiterate members of society gathered in the public houses or pubs to listen to their literate friends read aloud from the most recent publications. Arguments drew from the Bible, from history, from common sense, and from the creative applications of fables or even children's stories. Their goals varied widely to argue in favor of a complete break from the church, or only a partial one, or an internal reformation, or massive radical change, it really ran the gamut. Only one thing drew all of these pamphlets together, the legal requirement that they receive royal permission in order to be printed and distributed. The publication law meant that they had to be officially approved by the king's royal printer. Circulation must be approved in order to prevent scandal, libel, or sedition. The Reformation was a time of dangerous ideas. The government played with those ideas in order to advance their own authority. Yet it was critical that they send a message that just because some big things were changing, not all big things were open to debate. Censoring the new printing press was a crucial way of maintaining control during a period of major turbulence, and therefore all printed pamphlets must be approved before publication. Inflammatory images followed, peasants kissing the feet, knees, or buttocks of the Pope, even pro-Catholic language, emphasizing the ceremonial promises of the Church. So long as the content was religious in nature, it did not challenge the power and authority of the Crown, and the sharing of ideas flourished, until it crossed a line. In 1532, for instance, a friar gave an inflammatory sermon against Henry VIII and his intended bride Anne Boleyn, the future mother of Elizabeth I. 
His sermon was published and distributed far and wide as part of the growing national debate about religion, morals, and political power. Publications of the sermon illegally added the stamp of royal approval without obtaining the royal license first. Henry VIII responded by putting the friar under house arrest and discrediting his message. Attacks on the king and his royal family were surprisingly common, although technically illegal. The age of the printing press was a co-conspirator to the success of the Protestant Reformation. Without the ability for mass production, messages would not be spread so easily. Only in this way did Martin Luther go, as we might call it today, viral. And despite the passage of laws tightening permissions on who could write and publish their ideas, the idea of officially gaining the royal license was one notoriously easy to fabricate. All you had to do was print the words. The French ambassador Lancelot de Carle wrote a poem against Anne Boleyn by describing her lusty actions and secret affairs with five men, including her own brother. All five men and the queen herself were ultimately executed for the rumors of adultery. Rumor and gossip grew more powerful with the printing press involved. Anonymous pamphlets attacking the crown became a much more serious problem under the children of Henry VIII. His son, King Edward VI, was a minor during the radicalization of England. Some popular movements struck against the king's ministers. Other groups sought to slow the tide of change or even return to Catholicism entirely. These protests, particularly in the North, became a crisis under the reign of Edward VI. In response, Parliament passed new restrictions on who could gather in an assembly. The charges grew dramatically worse among pamphlets under the about face of Queen Mary, who was raised and remained a devout Catholic her entire life. So when Edward VI died very young, his eldest sister Mary became queen, Mary I. She attempted to return Protestant England back into the Catholic fold. Her work was about restoring her mother's reputation and undoing the work of her father's reformation. So much change so quickly did not sit well with the English public. Her marriage to the Spanish and Catholic King Philip and her policy of persecuting Protestants, which earned her the unfortunate nickname of Bloody Mary, only increased her unpopularity. Pamphleteers and broadside posters railed against the queen and her decisions. Her reign was brief, however, and she was soon succeeded by her sister, Elizabeth I. In the long run, Queen Elizabeth would prove to be more popular than her older sister Mary. One of her first acts as queen would be to bring her people together for religious purposes. Her religious settlement through the, quote, Act of Supremacy Law marked a new period of compromise within Protestant England. While technically both Elizabeth and Mary Tudor executed roughly the same number of people for blasphemy and similar religious crimes, Elizabeth's executions were spread out across 45 years. Mary's were only spread across six years. This distribution may have obscured the perception of persecution to leave Queen Elizabeth with a more popular reputation as Gloriana, the Virgin Queen, and her golden age of the Renaissance court. This isn't to say that good old Gloriana was popular during her reign. She had a series of crises and challenges to her authority during all four decades. Much of her popularity came surging in only after she died. As the arrival of a foreign heir to the throne came in to rule as king with his foreign counselors, this made many English subjects long for their former queen. When she was alive, however, plenty of people spread rumors and published seditious stories. Whenever possible, those people had to be punished. By law, Parliament supported Elizabeth with the basic concept that no one should discuss matters of marriage or children without her participation. The personal decision to marry and produce children was definitely a matter of state and heirs and who would come next, but it was a private matter as well, and one particularly worrisome in a community that was uneasy with being ruled by a single woman rather than a man. So in 1579, when a pamphlet began circulating about her private choice of husband, the queen grew quite upset. The pamphlet was delightfully called The Discovery of a Gaping Gulf, whereunto England is to be swallowed by another French marriage, if the Lord forbid not the bans. The bans was the announcement of marriage, the gaping gulf was the English Channel, and the swallowing had to do with the idea of a male French king subverting the female English queen if the marriage were to go forward. 
England has enjoyed centuries of antagonistic relationship with France as the subject of a French invasion in 1066, followed by the loss of the French lands under Henry II and his sons, the idea that France would return to England and render it a subservient state only became more powerful after the Reformation when England became Protestant, but France remained Catholic. The pamphlet argued that by age 46, Queen Elizabeth had no need for marriage, she was likely beyond her childbearing years. One could even argue that a marriage to produce an heir was highly valuable, but a marriage with no heir held no benefit at all. Such a marriage would merely put the queen and her kingdom into a position of being a good, servile wife to the man she married, a man who, if royal, would require her own kingdom to serve as wife to his. Imagine the horror of an England to serve as a nurturing wife to the Catholic French kingdom, what a scandal, what a crisis. And so this pamphlet published sound words against the queen's potential match with a French duke whose brother was king of France and the duke himself the presumed heir to the throne. No matter how sound the advice, it had the appearance of treason. It violated that law about publishing opinions concerning the decision that ought to be personal to the queen herself. And so the reaction was swift. Copies of the pamphlet were collected and burned in a public fire by the publishing liveries in London. The Queen ordered the author and his publisher to be arrested and favored the death penalty if they were convicted. However, upon their conviction, she was persuaded to approve a slightly less permanent penalty. Both publisher and author would have their right hands struck off. The author was appropriately named John Stubbs. He stood by the argument of the worthlessness of such a marriage and the fear that a marriage to a French Catholic would undo decades of a Protestant Reformation in England. He and his publisher, who was also appropriately named William Page, accepted their painful sentence and walked confidently to the public square where it was going to be carried out. John Stubbs was punished first. The historian William Camden records the event. Supposedly, Stubbs declared ever so slyly, Pray for me now, my calamity is at hand. Yes, hand. A meat cleaver was used to remove his hand, oh, and it was immediately cauterized to stop the bleeding. At this point, Stubbs used his left hand to remove his hat. God save the queen, he cried, before falling and fainting. Stubbs was carried away from the platform so that William Page, the publisher, could have his turn. William Camden again reports that he had the fine line. As his right hand was struck off and the wound cauterized, he too raised his hat and said to the crowd, I left there a true Englishman's hand. Both men were imprisoned afterwards for about 18 months and emerged from the ordeal considering themselves still to be true and loyal subjects. They both returned to publishing and writing and the Queen continued to keep a close eye on those who sought to publish claims about issues that she considered to be private. Perhaps the message got to her, though. When Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, she died an unmarried queen with no children, the Virgin Queen and Gloriana, who left her kingdom to a Scots cousin. And I hope today's tale has made you appreciate that you may post just about whatever you like concerning the marriage and issue of political powers and still expect to keep your hands. Let's all agree, though, that if someone must give a hand, we can certainly respect someone who gives it so willingly and with a pretty good line, too. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.